All right, 30 seconds and we'll get started. Good morning, everybody. My name is Doug Thies. I'm the founder of IT Leaders Louisville. We've been doing this in Indy for a number of years. Uh, we're, we got started last fall here in Louisville. This meeting is for directors and managers who are in staff IT positions, uh, folks who have direct reports who are really working on their leadership skills. Um, it's not really a sales-oriented meeting, uh, although we do have a few service providers here who have direct reports, people like Dion Dunn at Centric, he leads the group here and a few others. Uh, if, you are in, if you're a sales rep of some sort and you're interested in maybe getting involved in this group, there are some sponsorship opportunities. You can reach out to me directly. Um, Doug, did you just call me a sales rep? I, I call, no, I called you a service provider, I thought. Okay, thank you. I thought, maybe I was wrong. Um, most of us who are leaders have been promoted from fabulous individual contributors to some level of incompetence as a leader. Uh, it's often rare to get leadership training in engineering disciplines. IT is no exception on that. So this group is really designed to help you hear stories from other IT leaders and work on your own leadership skills. So what do we do here? Breakfast, looks like many of you are taking advantage of that, although nobody ever eats enough on these uh, things. The coffee always ends up getting, getting run out though, just like good IT people. Uh, networking, we spent the first half hour getting to say hello to each other. I am constantly amazed at how everybody in Louisville knows everybody else in IT. It's, it's fabulous. Uh, and I don't think it's healthcare related or, or anything else, it just seems like it's a small town, big city when it comes to IT folks. Um, leadership skills, we're gonna hear two speakers today, Letitia and Jeff, talk about how to be a better leader uh, from their experience. And then hopefully you're gonna find a mentor or maybe be a mentor to somebody in this room as time goes on and you get more and more involved in the IT community. Uh, please take a couple of pictures, um, whether it's of the crowd or the speakers, IT Leaders Lou is the hashtag that we use on Twitter. Post it on your social media, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn or something like that. We want to get the word out. We want more people to attend these meetings, and that is one of the most effective, simple ways to make that happen. You can text them to me, too. That's my mobile number right there on screen. Uh, if you want to know what the hell's going on with this group, uh, the easiest way is the website, itleaders.org slash Louisville. Uh, we keep up to date on the, f the upcoming meeting and any other events that are happening. You can sign up for the mailing list there so you get automatic notifications about the upcoming meeting. We are quarterly in 2023. Our meetings are quarterly, so the next meeting is in August. I'll talk about it in a second and then finally in November. It is very likely we're gonna to move to bi-monthly uh, in 2024, starting in February. So every other month, starting in February. This meeting is typically on the second Tuesday. So be aware of that, and we'll publish that schedule as time goes on. Uh, there's a couple of other, we like cross-promoting other events. Um, I don't have any uh, guests here who are involved with, directly involved with these events and the leadership. Love Rocket Women, uh, it is an IT organization focused on women here. Shannon Fear runs that thing. I love her, she's a ton of energy. Uh, and men are invited too, it's not just uh, for the ladies. So I'd encourage you to look that up. I believe it's rocketwomen.com is the website. Sammy, do you know I'm, about that? I'm highly involved with it as well. So there, there's a website, we have quarterly events as well, and there's multiple memberships you can join if your company's looking for it. There's great mentorship opportunities there as well, especially for women younger in their career. So there's lots of opportunity with that. So if you have questions, definitely feel free to reach out to me about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Shannon also knows every cool venue in the yes, city. Yes, she she's is. A planner, so she's yeah, she's. Uh, yeah. She, her superpower is venues for yes. sure. 
Um, the uh, Anna Kepshire does not have an event scheduled quite yet, but she runs KEP training and uh, they are an agile training group and she hosts events on a regular basis. She couldn't make it today, but I do want to mention her event. Uh, because she's full of energy and uh, seems to be doing great work in the community and, and is quite a connector, frankly. And then finally, the Louisville Microsoft Users Group, very vibrant Microsoft Users Group here in Louisville. Um, Mirazan uh, does a lot of the management of that, so I would encourage you, if, if that's your thing or if your infrastructure people or your software people are looking for places to network, and you know, sometimes they don't look, but they can benefit from it. I would encourage you to have a look at Luma. I believe it's Luma, right? Yeah, Luma.org. Anybody go to that one? Anybody ever been to that? Eric, what can you tell us about it? I mean, if you're into Microsoft technology, it's a great group. There's mostly 40 people there every month. And June 30th will be at Bellarmine. So. I've heard of that place. <laughs> Bellarmine University, June 30th. Okay, great. Um, this is the part that's for you. Uh, if any of you are in transition, do you mind standing up and briefly telling about what your role is and you know what you're looking for? Anybody in that boat right now? Good news, low employment uh, or low unemployment. Oh, we are. So I'm with Anna and Britton Arnett, and we are looking to hire like crazy right now. So we're doing a lot of. Um, one of our big areas is we have an on-prem on ADW that we're migrating to cloud. And so we're in Azure, we're looking for Databricks people, Snowflake, all the hot tech technologies. So Letitia knows how to reach me. So if you've got those people, we are wanting to hire those people. Your, your name again? Ann Britton is my first name. Arnett is my last name. So I go by AB. So. Got it. Thank you very much. Anybody else have open positions they're looking to fill? Chris. Hey, Chris Seid, Louisville Metro Government. Uh, we're looking for a senior IT manager to join our team as the director of Forestry Management Director, uh, oversees our data centers, operations, and networking. So, you know anybody looking? Uh, we're looking for somebody good. Louisville Metro Government. Chris is our next speaker. We'll talk about that in a second. Our next event uh, that is a bi monthly or a quarterly peer group, pardon me, is August 8th. Again, second Tuesday. Um, it is going to be back at Young Brands. We'll be back at the home base for our location uh, over on Colonel Sanders Lane. Uh, 1900 Colonel Sanders Lane is where it is. Chris, the man who just spoke, is our speaker. He's going to be talking about building a winning team. And then Mark Hamner. Mark, where are you? There you are. Mark's actually our other speaker. He's going to be talking about some of the community outreach opportunities that exist here in Louisville to bring along young people and also to help people who are in career changes. Did I describe that well? You did. Okay. Thank you, good. I'm, at, I'm excited about both of those talks. Back at Yum Brands. Uh, we had a happy hour scheduled um, for May and the downtown events um, caused us to have to cancel that. Uh, we are rescheduling it for June 21 uh, and it is going to be at uh, the Red Room, the Rabbit Hole Speakeasy. Chad, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you. Real quick, Chad Scott, uh, Guide Point Security. I'm excited about uh, sponsoring this event. It's at a speakeasy. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to get a scroll. And with the scroll, you're going to get a password. And you're going to get a knock. And then you're going to understand the knock. And after the password, you're going to get a code. And after that code, you're going to have to walk through a, a clock. So look for a clock. I'm just kidding. Show up. Three to five. I'll buy you a drink. Oh, I thought I had you, right? No, I did. But it is exciting. Have you, have you been to the Rabbit Room Speakeasy at Equus Jack's place? It's pretty remarkable. There is parking. It's on Shelbyville Road. When we choose there's events. There's parking here. Right, there's parking here. But sometimes <laughs> other happy hours I've chosen. Like, why do you have any parking for us, right? So, yeah, there's parking out there. We'd love to have you. Again, Guy Point Security is sponsoring it. Um, thank you so much for the, for the opportunity, Doug. We appreciate it. Happy to do it. The website is still showing the happy hour link as the old date, but go ahead and register for that in that. I'll get that updated here in the next couple of days. My, uh, my marketing team's up to their eyeballs in work because of the race in Indy and a variety of other events. But if you register in the happy hour slot off of itleaders.org.louisville, you'll be registered in the right event for June 21st. 
thank you, Chad and GuidePoint, for hosting that. Um, how can you help this group grow? Uh, I think it's very important for us to build this community further as time goes on. Uh, the best way you can do it is connect with me via LinkedIn. Uh, I've got a jillion connections, so um, it'll help you grow your network, if nothing else. Um, we post videos of this. You see Eric Feggi, who uh, is our videographer. We post videos of this on my company, Expedience YouTube channel, a couple of weeks after these events. So share those links to those events or share the links that I post about IT Leaders Louisville to your network so that you can get the word out. Um, and then schedule some time with me. I'll probably reach out to you if you're new here for a little bit of feedback about this meeting. Uh, just get the word out so that we can drive more attendance from more staff IT people. My experience is that staff IT professionals tend to go in to work and do their work and go home and the only people they know who are IT professionals are at church or the soccer field or some of their other spheres of influence. Why not build that network better? Uh, I have a saying, the best time to network is two years ago and the second best time is now. So. Take advantage of that and help your folks who may not be as network savvy to uh, come and see what this is all about. So a little bit of gratitude here. Centric Consulting locally has been hugely uh, involved in getting this group up and running. I've got Dion here. Who, who else from Centric in the room? Great, Dion, Chris, Carrie, uh, great team. I, I think they're amazing. They do fabulous work. I've known the Centric team in Indy for a great deal of time and have a lot of respect for the work they do. They helped us get the word out when this was brand new and nobody knew anything about what IT Leaders was. So thank you very much, Dion and Chris. Chris has been involved in all the administrivia um, and it's been great, it's been fabulous. My company, Expedient, is a data center and VMware cloud services firm. They hired me eight years ago to do community outreach and to help leaders be better leaders, along with providing them with next generation IT infrastructure. We're 14 data centers in 10 cities. Our closest data center is in Indy. We are actively hunting for a data center here in Louisville. Uh, we are looking for a data center that's corporate owned where the company would like to monetize it but doesn't want to move, so they could be our anchor tenant. Uh, we have a few caveats on what that, what's an ideal data center, but we're very interested in being another data center services provider here in Louisville. Today's speakers, we're gonna open with Letitia Schmidt, our host, hostess uh, from Humana here. Letitia has uh, a background in diversity and business aligned strategy here at Humana. She's gonna be talking about being an inclusive leader. Uh, followed, following Letitia is Jeff Dodson, an old friend of mine and former CIO up in Indy with United Health One. He's gonna be talking about creating a high performance culture and he's also gonna be talking about a, a peer group that he's starting up in Indy and there's enough interest maybe down here in Louisville as well. Any questions before we get started with the speakers? Timing's good. Letitia, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Welcome to Humana and to um, our Waterside building. We're so proud to have our Louisville community partners in the space and to share it with you. And we have some IT associates here locally sprinkled throughout the room. So thank you all for being here as well. I uh, am going to take a little bit of a different twist on this presentation just so that I can model some behaviors that I would like for you to take back into your workplaces as IT leaders and being inclusive leaders. Oftentimes I get invited to speak to a group internally, externally, and people want to know what's the magic sauce, what's the secret thing that I should say so that I can show up and be inclusive. I'm interested in gender equity. I want to talk about race, ethnicity, cultural competency and there's not a magic wand. And so there's some core beliefs that I personally have that I would like to share with you, and it's gonna start with doing some self-work. And that self-work is critical to being able to build community in your team, in your workspace. And we're gonna start there with talking about community. In order for you to get to know me a little bit better, I'm sharing a storyboard. Sharing a storyboard in a group like this is extremely 
extremely uncomfortable for me personally. The reason is I keep my life in separate spaces. My personal life is my personal life. My work life is my work life. I'm trying to do better at that. In telling my story, you can stand up in front of a group and read your bio. You can think about all of the accolades, the things that you've done. But who am I as a human and as a person? And this activity that I'm sharing with you is one that we did within our team. When we came together to form a new team, we started sharing stories. Who, what is our identity? What are things that I care about? What's important to me? And when you ask your team to do this, it changes the conversation in your staff meeting, in your projects, and in the way you show up. So part of my story that you'll see, I grew up in rural Kentucky on a tobacco farm. Yes, I, I drove a tractor at 13, set tobacco, followed the tobacco with a hoe so that we could uncover the plants, all the things throughout the year. My, has, my father worked construction and we um, managed the farm as he did that. I didn't have a TV in my house um, when I was growing up. The bookmobile drove by every other Tuesday and we read religiously. I still love books. I'm a competitive game player. If you're playing Uno, Chick a Pig, a Checkers, uh, Connect Four in my house, you are not given the privilege to win. It will be competitive. So uh, just keep in mind that the, the kids always knew they had to play um, with some skill. You're not getting by easy. I love baking cakes. I, I tease and say that I personally um, had kids so I can make birthday cakes. I don't know why. That's something creative that I love to do. A couple of my homemade creations, which are funny to me to share per publicly, um, are there, but the kids always loved it. And um, my family is here. My son Elliot is 16. He's a student at Atherton. He plays basketball. Our dog Dusty came along during the pandemic. Um, he's a wire fox terrier and just so much fun. Nolan, um, with his ukulele, that was his birthday gift a couple of weeks ago. He plays drums, he's in drama, he loves baseball, um, he play, He runs track, he, he just is a kid that loves everything. And my husband, Jerry, who's a physical therapist. Um, so whenever you see my story in this way, you just learned a ton about me that hopefully resonated and can connect with you as well. My lifelong learner really is what I typically would tell you in my professional story. I would leave all that other stuff out, um, but my career started out, I have a degree in business education and computer science, thought I would teach middle school. Um, what happened was ended up going into a software learning company in the mid 90s and became a Microsoft Certified Trainer, Microsoft Certified Solutions Developer. And that launched my career in the technology space. I started at Humana after being with five other companies in Indianapolis and Louisville. Started at Humana 20 years ago um, in, as an applications engineer. Have managed a couple of teams, led a couple of teams here internally before moving into the space of DEI. I have certifications in bias training, culture evolution, I'm a diabetes prevention life coach, and um, a member of the Society for Diversity. So all a whole lot in a little bit of space. And I would encourage you to take this back and do something similar for your own self work. It's hard putting your life story on a page. There's so much um, from a conversation point that can happen out of your personal storyboard. So to get started, I am going to go back to where the example of teaching middle school um, because we're going to use some pen and paper. I'm going to make you really uncomfortable and that's holding a pencil today or an ink pen because whenever I talk about self work and our small group activity, I want to give one stack that you can see that will be kind of helping you see. Sure. Um, I just try to count them off so if we do that and then if anybody needs a pencil. Because when I get invited to come into a staff meeting and to a talk, my work accountability right now is I lead the um, interaction with our people analytics team and our business teams. And so when we look at people analytics internally and our DEI metrics, there's intentionality set between, behind the goals and the efforts that we set to increase not only the inclusion index of our associates through associate engagement, but representation within our leadership. 
And whenever we talk about metrics and talk about DEI, sometimes people want to go there first. But before we can get into that headspace, I want to spend some time talking about how we build community. So when we think about community and the definition of community, I'll just take a couple of shout outs, really. What is it you think of when you think about community? Support. Thank you. Camaraderie. Camaraderie. People. Lots of people. Lots of people. <laughs> values. Shared values. Shared values. That's a good way. Oftentimes, it's the bigger we, right? It's all the people that Dion's talking about. So whenever we think about what community means to us personally, then it's one way to think about it is being intentional about the systems and structures in which people interact. And so when you think about community, it could be your individual team, it could be a, a cross-functional group, it could be um, a city, a state community, it could be an IT community in a, a regional area like this. We're, we're building community. So what are the benefits of community? When you think of having a sense of community in the workplace, what are some benefits? Support. Support within the workplace. Advocacy. Advocacy. Some kind of common interest. Common interest, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. When you think of all those things happening, what are the outcomes? What, what? Goal attained. Goal attained, yeah. So you're working towards a mission or a goal and by building that community within that enterprise, within that team, then you can attain those goals. And so when we think about DEI and how we show up in the DEI space, and I was talking about, I get called into meetings like, tell me what to say, tell me what to do. It really is about thinking about the role that you play in that sense of community. And so when we think about moving and shifting that, there are different lenses that we can look at whenever we think about um, perceptions, and that's where I wanna go next, but there's a concept that we explored deeply at Humana that was with one of our partners talking about culture and how our thoughts shape our beliefs and our beliefs shape our behaviors and our behaviors influence results. Thoughts behaviors, results. And that framework is what we're going to just take a little bit of a deeper plunge into because whenever we think about thoughts, all the things that you saw on that storyboard about me shaped my thoughts. The fact that I don't know any theme songs for sitcoms in the 80s drives my husband crazy that I shared with you. <laughs> Didn't have TV. So when we think about lenses that shape our perception, then it really comes down to a couple. These three concepts are covered in a book that I have referenced at the end. Um, the book is called, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you this. Let's see, I think it's no, Why No One Understands You and What to Do About It, okay? <laughs> I had to read that book. But whenever you think about the work that I do and the evolution of my career from technology into DEI and equity and fairness and trying to bring all of that together, I shared this presentation with a friend of mine this week and he was like, whoa, Letitia, that's kind of heady. And I was like, that's what I like about it, right? I like being in what's the neuroscience behind what's happening within our brains that causes us to behave a certain way. And so whenever I think about community, what is it that you as an individual do to influence around you? And whatever you're doing is shaped by a perception that you have that comes from your background and your culture. And so when we think about lenses that shape perception, um, Heidi Grant Halverson in his book talks about trust, power, and ego. So when you think about trust, are you a friend or a foe? What's happening around you? Think about um, power, it's really around um, your influence, what do you have influence over? And you think about ego, oftentimes it's like what perception is of me or who is influencing me. So today we're gonna focus in on power. Power is interesting. 
And when we think about creating an environment that drives equality, drives fairness, then one thing that came to my attention and caused me to go down this path of trying to study how power exists and what happens is I was at a presentation recently and the keynote speaker said that DEI is really not just about representation, which is a lot of my work, is looking at how do I drive representation and leadership through the behaviors of our managers and leaders across the board. It's not just about representation, it's about how do you stand in the gap of power? So when we think about community, how it exists, and all the systems that interact, we have a role to play. And then when you think about power dynamics of who has resources, who has access to information, who's benefiting, who is making the decision, who's driving the outcome, and you might have your own definition, but for me today, I mean, that's where power lives. And we wanna be able to stand in the gap of where that power and decisions are being made to disseminate all of that information, all of that sharing, so that we can create a more inclusive culture. And it's fascinating, so uh, as part of this book, there's a story that she shares about research that was done by this group from in Berkeley, and she's, talking about um, how they were assigning social status to people based on vehicle. So bear with me for a minute. Set your egos aside. I'm not judging what car you drive, <laughs> how you got here today. But I'll say there are some vehicles in our community that weren't equipped with turn signals. Most of those are uh, viewed as higher status vehicles, Mercedes, Porsche, BMW. If you just hang with me, those are considered higher status vehicles according to this um, Berkeley research. What they did is started observing at a stop sign who was stopping to yield at the stop sign. It's a power dynamic, right? So you're watching whenever you pull up to the stop sign, you have a mental model in your head of who gets to go first or who goes next, usually to the right. I have all these things I'm processing. And then I get tired of everybody not moving and I just go and my son freaks out. But whatever happens when you pull up to that stop sign, in this research, they were observing what they assigned as higher status vehicles. And if they yielded in the stop, turn, in the stop sign order. And what they discovered is those cars that were assigned higher status only stopped 50% oh, 50% of the time. The other cars stopped 25% of the time. So not everybody stops, right? But that's what they were doing in this research. So then they moved their study to a crosswalk. And they started observing higher status, that their definition of higher status vehicles, and how they were interacting at the stop walk, and when people were standing there. And what they observed was that higher status vehicles stopped 30% of the time for people in a crosswalk. The rest of the vehicles, um, kind of more lower status vehicles, were stopping 7%, but what they noticed, oh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> they, I might have this backwards, let me say it. I did write it down. 93%. 93%, yeah. Yeah, they failed to yield, that's how they wrote it. Sorry, <laughs> failed to yield, 7%, thank you, Amy. So what, what they did is they observed that the cars who had were beat up, ragtag vehicles, rag in the gas cap, they stopped 100% of the time at the crosswalk. So the theory in their research and how it came into play in this power conversation is that it's not that higher status people don't interact with you or see or engage with you because they think they're more important is they don't see you because they don't need you. So it's fascinating because one of the highest forms of respect, if you look in some of the Ubuntu principles and um, culture, is the highest form of respect is seeing someone, acknowledging. And after I read that, I was going in a shopping center, standing at a crosswalk, lady didn't stop. There were the stop signs here. 
I looked immediately to see what kind of car she was driving. I was like, I'm going to check your social status and put this stereotype right on you, ma'am. But um, it, it's interesting just the observations that come into place. So if you think about the fact that not only do I not necessarily need you to create community, to achieve what I need to achieve next, I don't see you. So it's not like I think less of you. I don't think about you at all. So when you think about community and the role that you play within your organization and who you need, maybe who you don't pay attention to, how do you shift that in the collaboration to drive different outcomes? And so I wanted just to have you think about how those social constructs in your environment come together so that you can build intentionality in what those interactions look like as to who gets seen, who has visibility, who's making decisions, and how you're shifting power. And if you're not the one holding the power, then how do you stand in the gap of who is holding the power? Every interaction that you're in, there's a power dynamic energy in that interaction. Sometimes it will be within your influence, sometimes you're in that conversation. So we're gonna just talk about how you know, different ways to be better together. And we're gonna do that through a table exercise. Before I set that up, a um, couple other things I just wanted to have you think about in the sense of community. When people ask me, well, what are the metrics I should know? What are some things I should say? I hesitate to do that. And when I talk about self-work, reading books, engaging in community experiences like we're having today, that's the real work. Knowing what are your beliefs. You know, people get frustrated with different personality tests or brainstorming activities. It's not about the results. It's about the self-reflection that you had when you went through that experience. What did you learn about yourself that influences how you show up the next interaction that you you can disagree. I think there are tons of surveys out there. You can totally disagree with whatever that survey um, leadership personality came back. The learning happens in thinking about why you agree or disagree. I don't mind if you disagree with me today. It's totally fine. The learning happens in building your position and your knowledge based on your thoughts around how that shows up and how you plan to um, share or interpret that information. So when we think about that role of community being a larger ecosystem and your identity and how you show up in that ecosystem, that's how we're gonna set up this activity, is that we're gonna do some small group work just to think about decisions that you make as a leader. And so we think about decisions and where they live in your organization. There could be a crisis that happens there could be an emergency, and you might not be the most collaborative. So this may not apply to, if you leave here and there's an accident on the highway, you might not think about all of your collaborative skills and tools, right? Uh, but if there's an opportunity for you to be intentional and slow down and pause, I have a favorite saying in every conversation that you hear me share publicly, is we sometimes have to slow down to speed up. And taking that pause and really being intentional about those interactions is important. When I'm asked, what do I say, what can I do, the reason I can't give those answers is because I don't know you deeply personally. I have coached leaders in our organization to be on a panel to address a certain topic, to really examine their ideas, and whenever they go into that panel, they do amazing, but the next time they're on a stage in the auditorium and get a question about DEI, they say that same thing that applied three weeks ago to a totally different concept, and that scares me to death. So I can't tell you what to say. I can bring you along this journey. Think about your own self-work that has to happen and encourage you, and I'm always happy to bounce ideas off when someone's preparing for a public experience like that, but you, all, you can't take some comment that was shared in one meeting and just automatically apply it. You have to really know the um, situational awareness there. So we think about your role um, in the system and we think about all of the things that are at play. Oftentimes people say, 
I didn't, I didn't cause harm. I didn't say anything. I was just an innocent bystander. And truly, there are no innocent bystanders. Bystander is a choice. You're either influencing positively or you're influencing by not engaging. And that could cause harm. And so whenever we think about that phrase and knowing that you're allowing it, as leaders, we know anything that we allow, we just set the bar. That's the new standard. In community, it's the same thing. Whenever you allow it, you just set the bar. That's the new standard. So let's go into our small groups at your tables and look at your activity. I want you just to quickly capture a list of actions and decisions that leaders make. So brainstorm, talk amongst yourselves. What are some key topics that leaders make or decisions that leaders make on a regular basis? So jot down uh, a list. Um, you can think about what decisions you have to make today. In the next couple of weeks, we talked about some decisions this morning whenever Doug opened the room around um, open positions. When you think about your list, I heard some great um, items. We're going to go to the next step, but first I just wanted you to brainstorm what are some decisions that you make. And you all were like popcorn um, because this is the life you live and breathe and sometimes sucks the life out of you, right? So what are some of those quick decisions that you can shout out quickly? Performance evaluation. Okay. You have a good one over here, Carrie. Uh, assigning resources to problems. Okay. Back here with Chad. I, I'm sorry. No, that's the boring one. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's boring? Hiring and firing. Yeah. For management of workforce. Okay. So when you think about all the decisions that you make, I want you to review your list and as a group, just look at those items and I want you to think about what the best action is. And so I gave you a cheat sheet on your document. The bottom has A through L. I think L is make up your own. But those are items that you can do to build community. So. See if you can identify any of those items. I'll put them on the board up here, but they're kind of small. These are ways to build community. Find a couple of your items and see if you can find a solution and talk about it with your group. So maybe just pick two. I didn't realize, um, I don't want to keep you too long before we hear from Jeff. So pick two items that you prioritize as decisions you have to make and see if any of these options will be a solution that you can attempt whenever you are sharing or shifting power. Because what we're trying to do is shift our role as leaders from making all the decisions. And here are several clues in how you could do that. All right, let's come back together and let's do a, a group share. What I loved about walking around the room is that you all were really applying your scenarios to these solutions. Uh, originally, I was thinking about just sharing these concepts, but being able to apply it gives you an opportunity to think about when you are in the seat of making a decision, how can you make your life easier, for one, but also build community in your organization or your team at the same time. So I'm going to do quick, um, maybe two to four examples and walk through how you would apply it. Who would like to share, uh, with, who will share an example with us that you picked? I like using skip level meetings as a way to kind of shift power. Okay. Skip level meetings, giving opportunity to shift in the community, that, uh, shifting power. That's a great idea. You talked about kind of two tied together, the stay, stay focused on a shared mission and then also actively give credit to everyone who contributed to a process activity and goal. Because oftentimes it's like you'll say somebody, great job, or that you did a really good job today. And then it's what's the specific thing behind that that's actually helping move the ball forward? Like how can you be more granular with that instead of just giving them the 
thumbs up, pat on the back, like a yeah. sticker almost, rather saying, this was amazing how you approached it this way because it's gonna impact this end goal. So kind of more outcome based too. I um, love that because I personally love to hear yes. that kind of Everybody feedback. Loves to hear. It's not <laughs> just you did a good job, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. It's what was specific. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I've had to ask that, why, why are you saying that? Mm-hmm. What is it I should keep doing? Yeah. So that's a great one. Uh, whenever I look at H, sometimes as a leader, this is a really hard thing for me because I think it's your job. Just do your job. I don't need to praise you for it, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously. But whenever I see giving credit and sharing successes, there are different ways to do that because some people in our environment, um, in a corporate setting, think I'm not going to give praise because what if I miss someone? What if I, and so I don't give any praise. My leader has a great example of this where she has shifted the power of recognition and every month we give a list of accolades to her and we share them in a staff meeting. Everyone on the team can share an accolade about anyone else on the team and they all get shared at the end of the month. I didn't have to go through and think, what all did we go to production with? What is it that we're working on? How did this person show up? Collectively, our community of a team comes together and shares that list of accolades for our colleagues. And it's amazing. It's really fun and celebratory. I love that too, because it kind of creates that sense of community like you're talking mm-hmm. about, where you're building up trust <coughs> with other people as well, which is yeah. really amazing. So we have this thing with this called the Core Award, and tonight is our business unit meeting in Cincinnati, and someone else from the team will nominate a person, and then the partners get together and kind of vote on who got the most nominations and then the person who nominated the person who wins gets stands up and yes. tells everybody why and gives them kind of the accolades that way and it's it's a great little celebration i love it is. i love it and that's a practice my leader does have i forgot about that step she does a drawing if you nominated someone you get in a drawing for a, a little treat and so that incentivizes it and recognize the people because it takes time to acknowledge yeah. people it really is something where it's kind of so fast we don't take the time to do it. All right, over here on the side, anybody have an example? We, we have um, a couple of us at I, um, just seems very easily, you know, to do and set up, right? Just a lot, um, create space to share successes. Um, instead of jumping right into the work or the project or the task, okay. right? Just take a few minutes and then um, Chris here has a, they, they kind of have that in place already, so that's kind of neat. And awesome. So it's an opportunity to just take something simple and implement um, starting with that. Great. Thank you for that one. So your intentionality and how you show up is really important. And we did some work with Sin Delaney, a, a leadership development partner. Some of you may have experience in that mood elevator that you're talking about allows you to kind of put some words um, to what your feelings are. And we're not always great about checking in with ourselves before we go into a space. And so acknowledging that is really great. But on the side, any Anybody else have an example? What's a decision that you make and what's a solution that you came up with? We talked a lot about, well, I can't remember, H, M, A, as far as being within a town hall setting and being able to allow your workers to run that town hall, make them interactive, also make them be responsible for those decisions that are being assimilated to the mass so they feel not only empowered but they also understand the work behind the work. Absolutely. That's a great one. I put my glasses on so I can see you back there. But um, when you think about rotating opportunities and allowing people to um, be empowered, have visibility, right? That's a great way for people to have visibility. We, um, on our Monday stand-ups, we rotate who is hosting that. 
it's fascinating because it shifts the power. It's not always the leader coming in with a message to relay. It's someone on the team hosting that experience, that pull-up conversation, and they get to plan it. And you see their personalities come out and the way that they bring the energy. And it's not just one person. And so when you think about the town hall, the large scale meetings where you're trying to give visibility to more people in your organization, it doesn't always have to be leader led or leader driven. I um, want to call out a couple on here um, as we wrap up. The uh, setting clear expectations for roles and making that expectation visible for everyone. If I have a conversation with Jeff and I say, you're going to be in charge of the budget, that's all you have to pay attention to right now, and nobody else knows that he's in charge and he shows up with that commitment and the, what, that conversation, people are probably aren't going to really respond well because they're like, why does he keep asking about the money and how much it costs? But if you make it visible that I expect that Jeff is gonna take care of this and this is his role and it's visible. I have shared decision making and authority with someone on my team and people know that so they know to expect it. Um, the, the group agreements about how to handle conflict, conflict is great. You, we say sometimes healthy tension. We wanna have dialogue and conversation. <coughs> That's where learning and innovation happens. If we all get in this mindset of group think, not necessarily the best outcome. And so group agreements about when it happens, how are we going to handle that conflict can be helpful. Um, allowing teammates to present about their own work. As leaders, we are engaged deeply in how the work is being executed, what the outcomes are, and representing it to our upper management. But if you find yourself talking about someone else's work and they're not present, how do you shift the power to give them visibility? I sat through a data analytics discussion where the person presenting kept talking about the, the lady who did all of the research, how great her work was and what she did, and she did that. And all I could think was, where is she? Maybe she was out ill that day, I'm not sure. But more often than not, we take and present someone else's work. Shifting power means you're supporting, you're building a platform for them to speak about their work and lift that up so that your leaders, partners, and um, customers can hear them talk about it. One last one. Um, when we think about sharing opportunities for people to engage, a lot of disparity happens sometimes in the way that we hire, how we pick people to lead projects and give resource assignment. If you're wanting to help someone grow and expand, and stretch, then you want to publicize those opportunities so people can raise their hand. Whenever jobs aren't posted and after it's filled, someone comes up and says, I didn't even know you were hiring a VP. I would have liked to apply. If you're not allowing people to raise their hand, you may never know what their desires and aspirations are or even to talk to them about what their potential is. And so making it equitable would be giving them the opportunity to raise their hand. So a lot of nuggets on here that I want you to consider. And just thinking today of the conversation you had at your table, the things that I've shared, what is one thing you can do? Just set a time-bound goal around that and then repeat. Go back and look at the list. I gave you the cheat sheet so you can see what is something I would like to apply in my team to build community. Community creates a more inclusive space, allows you to be a more inclusive leader, and breaks down barriers. Oftentimes, I'm or ask about cancel culture. I don't want to show up in this DEI space because I don't want to be canceled. If I say something, it's going to be the wrong thing. But you know where there's psychological safety to say the wrong thing? In a community. Did you do the work to build a community on your team so that when you trip, someone is going to catch you? They're going to gracefully call you in and not call you out. That's what community is about. It's about taking risks in a small group so that you can be riskier in a larger setting. It's about practicing conversations that are hard in a small group so that you can flex that muscle whenever you're in a decision making that's outside of that small group. So quickly, just write down one action that you're willing to commit to that was on your list because I want you to practice it. 
if it's making a hiring decision and you're going to build an interview panel, think about when you can apply that. If it's putting shared successes in your team and write down when you'll do it because you're going to see in this group your community here in a couple of months. And I would love for you to share with each other what did I achieve. The resources here are shared. Um, the book, No One Understands You and What to Do About It, I, I love and recommend it. Heidi Grant Halverson. If you don't want to read the book, she has some great TED Talks. There is a 12-minute TED Talk out there um, with Amy Edmondson. She does a lot of psychological safety and some of the research she did with Google. But she, in this TED Talk, talks about how to turn a group of strangers into a team um, based on some real-life stories that she's woven into that experience. There's an HBR article that was published recently that was by a friend of mine, Pam Graham Lee, who's out of Indianapolis and leads the Integrating Women Leaders Foundation. She actually, um, I was at an event last night where she was presenting and she has published an HBR article around men are worse allies than they think. And she said, I hate that title. No one's gonna read it. But whenever they published it, that was the title that was given. The fascinating thing is, she leads the Integrating Women Leaders Foundation, did a survey in Indianapolis and Louisville, and then a lot of the communities that she supports contributed. So it's people like you who are responding to the survey about their experiences. If you want a cheat sheet, go read her article because it talks about how men who are in ally groups for women show up in different ways than people who um, are not engaged and actively seeking how to be an ally. There's some practical tips in that article. And if you are interested, um, I, on behalf of my organization, I don't sponsor and advocate for other companies, but to know that her um, conference has an allyship component in it in October that's dedicated toward um, gender equity. So now, thank you for playing along with me. And, <laughs> and thank you, Doug and Chris, for having me. Greatly appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Jeff. Well, it's, there's a, an amazing amount of similarity between the stuff that Leticia was talking about and what I'm going to be talking about. But let's, just a little bit more about me. My mm -hmm. leadership journey is really long, because I'm <laughs> old. But until recently, it was all about my own success, leading my own teams, my own organizations, large ones. I've been in a CIO role at Sony, Ascension Health, and most recently United Healthcare. So I was focused on my team's doing well, my organization's doing well. Um, and now I'm chasing my purpose and passion to serve others in their leadership journey. Culture is one of my favorite topics. Um, I was a certified culture facilitator at United so I recognize the mood elevator. I recognize you were talking, you described the results cone, and I saw the human operating system. Those are all things that I'm familiar with, but that's not what I'm talking about here, because that was the culture I was in. So I'm gonna start talking about it and what you can do. So sometimes when you see these slides, you could maybe think, oh, I'm talking about your senior leaders where you don't have any control. The truth is you have control over your own team culture, organization culture, whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, I didn't even realize it, but that was what I was using to turn around underperforming IT organizations all along the way. Um, so before we move on, who can tell me why creating a great culture matters? Keep your employees. Keep your employees. Attract employees. Attract employees. Productivity. You spend too many hours together each day and be unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> culture kills strategy. Culture <laughs> kills strategy. So at the end of the day, all of those things are important, but they're lead indicators to the lag indicator of performing better. We wouldn't be worrying about attracting talent, retaining talent, productivity, even all the stuff that you just went through. Those things matter because at the end of the day, your teams thrive, and thriving teams perform better. I guarantee you, United Healthcare wouldn't have made the investments in culture they were making if it wasn't about that. So, um, how many feel like today they're living inside an IT 
intentional culture. That's good. You know, uh, every, every company has a culture. They just might not know it, uh, but some do. And some, there's a lot of them I think you can go into the lobby and you can find the core values on the wall in a poster. But how many organizations actually drive consistent habits, behaviors, and performance from top to bottom? Even in all the investment that United Healthcare was making in culture, that was not happening. But you as a leader can pick it up from there and you can drive it uh, throughout. So today, I'm gonna talk to you uh, specifically of what you might be able to do to create your own culture that not only delivers results, but you can actually show it. I think that, don't you think that leaders can either cascade the desired culture or kill it? No doubt, no doubt. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk, that's my, one of my favorite topics, the leadership shadow, which probably sounds familiar to mm -hmm. some of you. Um, and we'll talk about both sides of that coin. But this is, I like this slide because it helps you see culture's a lot of things. And most of these are, so when you would define your culture, it would be built on a set of norms around these things. And there's a lot of them, and to get them consistent uh, takes a lot of work. So to your point, Amy, it's not only the, the behaviors, me modeling that I think are the right ones, it's also not tolerating the ones that kill it. Uh, I, I might have an opportunity to talk a little bit more uh, about that. So driving consistency through all of this is really what it's about. And so trying to break out of my mold of what culture looks like, pull in somebody else, Cameron and Quinn, they're talking about four different cultures and they're defining them from two competing uh, dimensions internal focus and integration versus external focus and differentiation, as well as flexibility and discretion versus stability and control. So as you combine those two competing forces, they came out into four different types of cultures that you can see here, clans, autocracy, market, and hierarchy. Probably you've lived in one or more of those that you can recognize. Another way um, of looking at it would be through let's call them values. Uh, you can see there's some fascinating thing to me is that the top two are so far above all the rest in terms of how, what percentage of organizations adopt those. So clearly United was focused on results. When I was at Ascension Health, caring was a faith-based culture purpose and they all drop off. The interesting thing is that for the first two, those stay consistent across industries, uh, characteristics, and uh, so on. The others are industry dependent. So one of the things that's missing from that is when I was at Sony, it was based on quality. Everything revolved around quality. Interesting enough, I don't see that up there. So, um, what other, what other values have you seen or think that cultures are based on? Innovation. Innovation. Diversity. Diversity. Ego. Ego. Yeah, that's the one you don't want to work in, but yes. <laughs> that's that's kind of like AB's point. The, the leader's ego can kill the whole thing. Or actually, it's, they're, they're creating the one they want. They just don't realize they're killing themselves by doing it. Ethics. Ethics. Yeah, ethical. That, you could probably imagine that a healthcare system might put that in there. Yeah. And I'm hoping my financial planner has ethics at the top of the list, too. <laughs> well, I like to think about it this way. Is your culture actually contributing to good performance or is your culture acting as an obstacle to good performance? So let's take a quick poll. Who thinks their culture, and it doesn't have to be your broad culture, it could be your own team or a team you're on. Who's living in a culture where that the culture is 
wind in your sails and leading to great performance. Eccentric people, I know. Yeah. Great. How many people are living in a culture they think today is an impediment to great results? Nobody. It's hard to raise your hand with a camera anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we all know where everybody's working. As an, indi <laughs> as an independent now, I can get away with it. But. So the key metaphor is the chocolate fountain. And what I want to it, because it all rolls downhill, so it's, I'm sorry it's brown, it's but it's chocolate. <laughs> it's really good. Um, and the leader's on the top. That doesn't mean it's the CEO. It could be you. It could be you as the leader of your organization, and you're rolling your culture uh, downhill. So I'm sure many of you have been in the same situation that I was in throughout my career, where I was in an organization that really didn't take the culture that seriously. I didn't, didn't necessarily know it at the time, but I was creating a culture for my team to lead to great performance. And a lot of it had to do with maybe I was lazy because I hated heroics. And so building that culture where it led towards effortless execution and great results was ultimately easier on me. So let's begin with what not to do. And I'm guessing that you can resonate with quite a few of these mistakes. So the first mistake is senior leadership invests in a big marketing campaign. So big companies like United can't afford to hire a marketing company to promote a program. But what happens when they do that? It it's leads to cynical employees who are thinking it's program of the month, it's a lot of sizzle, but, the, but this is the senior leadership basically saying, yeah, we're not going to do the work. We're going to we hired a marketing firm to do it. My favorite one is senior leadership goes on a boondoggle, and with a couple of well, we're here in Louisville, so a couple of bourbons in them, <laughs> playing golf. They have an epiphany about what culture should be, and they're going to come back and dump it on their employees and and uh, wash their hands. So of course, if when it's being dumped on the employees, not going very well. Or they say the employees are going first. You're going to do all the hard work. Immediate cynicism that this is so important that the, the leader, whether we're talking about the CEO who cares about the whole company or you're the leader of your organization, you must start it. And you have to examine your current behaviors and habits and whether they're leading to or away from the, the type of culture that you're interested in. Most senior leaders avoid this because it's the vulnerability comes in about I might not be doing this right, and also it's very hard work. So you can't stick with it for, without hard work. Next is importing from, so we're in Louisville again, GE culture. Back when I was really young, GE culture was what I stepped into. That was dominated by the, the uh, celebrity CEO culture, I would say, at the time. These are kind of old. I worried about it a little bit. I thought a lot, like Sen Delaney. Would that mean we're importing Sen Delaney's culture in, or are we taking Sen Delaney's wisdom and experience and adapting it? So it's it's careful, but again, this is, this is senior leadership pressing the easy button. We don't want to do the hard work. Let's just borrow somebody else's idea. This is similar. Pick one from column A and two from column B. It, I think it's worse than the previous because it's total chaos, and it is trying to avoid the hard work. Next one, and I like to stop here because I think those of us in IT see this all the time. So who can help me understand why focusing on perks and enjoyment is a mistake when it comes when it's about culture? It's false, a false idea. Yeah, it really is. It's it's almost like a sleight of hand trick. And sometimes I think it's perceived as how do I make you spend more hours in the office? Mm. It's like let me get your dry cleaning and take care of your kids so you can just stay right there. <laughs> Aren't you the cynical one? <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Really put up heavy in performance optimization. If 
that's the emphasis, yeah, for sure. Obviously it's fun, you know, but I think, I think people perform better when it's a little less serious and you can be yourself, but as a focus for your culture, I think that's a big mistake. Next one is uh, turning a virtue into weakness. So you probably hear this sometimes even in your own personal behavioral profiles. I can take a strength and go too far and now it's a weakness. Um, my example here is I had a boss ask me once, have we taken Agile too far? And I was like, not just no, but hell no. But this is a really big subject and probably be better for another day. However, if you want to hear the colorful, colorful version of that story, just buy me a bourbon and we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about it. This one's another big one. So, And I think it's related to the leaders not going first or the leaders launching it and backing away. Uh, I saw this at United in spades, where ah, the culture's for you guys, not really us. Look at these people we're promoting to AB's point. We were getting people promoted and you're going, how in the world? That person's operating so far outside of the culture. How is this happening? And I don't think the senior leaders understood what message that was sending to everybody else. But you, this would take hard work, and if it's not starting with a vulnerable leader who's driving the program, this probably isn't happening. Lastly, just like every other project we do in IT, there's never enough time and never enough budget. There's no easy button for creating a high-performing culture. It is work that is challenging. It's fun if you know what you're doing, but it takes a lot of time, and it takes an investment. And when United started this journey back in 2008, the CEO was all behind it. There was, uh, he articulated it as a 30-year journey. People like me were getting taken out of your job, getting trained for four weeks to be a certified culture facilitator, sent out to do stuff. A new CEO comes in, it starts to wane. Next CEO comes in, it's dead. So uh, that 30-year journey probably stopped. I imagine it's being redefined. Okay, so talked about all the stuff not to do. Well, to, the good news is there is a process um, that can help you walk your way through it and get real culture change. The first thing you've got to start with is why. I think we started with it early. If the why is about just attracting employees, you might do mistake number six. If it was just about community, it might not go all the way there. Those, again, are leading to, I want a great culture because I want this to be the choice place to work, but I want it to be the choice place to work because we're going to kick butt. It has to be about getting to that real meaningful goal that hopefully even the market could see a difference. Next, this is really big. Um, you probably, I know, so it's kind of funny. My personal experience of this is my wife says, you have got to stop talking about culture. <laughs> Why? It's a really big deal. Well, to her, it's because it was the fuzzy term, usually described in adjectives. It was not concrete enough. So this is the place where you've got to get very specific about what it is you're trying to accomplish. What are the habits? What are the behaviors? Define them clearly so that everybody understands what they are and you're going to have to drive them all the way down and you're going to be specific about if we do this, I expect performance to go from here to here. And then, really importantly, is you got you to measure it and I would say if United had done a good job of demonstrating changes in performance by investing in culture, it would still be having lots of momentum. But when challenged with a budget like that, and you're taking senior level executives on the road to do the workshops, they're going to get challenged. You've got to be able to come back and say, this is what's happening. Again, the top leaders go first. Uh, and if they don't, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. So as you look at this slide, what challenges do you see for yourself? Changing habits. 
experience as a leader is far harder than I think many of us are willing to adopt. Yeah, what was it that Eric said last night? Everybody wants change, but they don't want to be the one to change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Anybody else? I think it's that clear expectation. Um, I think sometimes we always say we don't know and we don't care, right? But they don't know. It's the leader's fault. Absolutely. They don't care. It's their fault. There's a better place. It seems like a fundamental leadership concept, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's going to fail a lot of other places other than just trying to create a good culture if you're not doing it. Yeah. Anybody else? I'll say re examine who you're promoting in, in your role. Because so often, it's kind of like what you talked about earlier, people will say their culture is one thing, but you look at who can get promoted as senior to junior or executive, and it's the people who can be harshest and mean because they get crap done, basically. Toxic performers yeah. is what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so let's, one of my favorite topics to talk about is the leadership shadow. And so what you're describing falls into the, the, what you permit, you promote. So if, if, if your culture doesn't promote the idea of being harsh in meetings, why in the world are you permitting it? And I know why they permit it. This, is, this was one of my favorite, I was digging for years to try to, rationalize why people with allegedly good cultures or even leaders with really solid values permitted this behavior. And it was always about they get results. So I kept digging because I knew there had to be an answer. You gotta be able to show me the fuzzy math of what they add versus what they take away from the organization. So after years of asking the question and digging, I finally found it. When you have a leader operating like they're never alone, unless they're on an M&A team and they don't have any direct reports, but if they're a leader or on a team, that type of behavior is stealing 50% of the capacity of every other person on that team. And the reason why the addition by subtraction method works is if they're on a team of 10 and you take that one out, you just got four and a half FTEs of capacity back without adding anyone. And I have personally seen that work. I didn't know that's what I was doing until after the fact. And after the fact, it was amazing. It re and, and it, it, but it's hard because people are like, how can, you, how can you take Joe out? He's getting results. And it's hard to demonstrate that where that other 50% is getting taken away. But I can tell you it's there for sure. Okay. The other part of the culture that I think, at least for me, was uh, it felt like a nice to have, but this is the reinforcement structure, if you will. We're really serious about our culture because we're baking it into all of our supporting systems and structures. And when, where's the best time to keep somebody that doesn't fit in your culture out? Hiring. The front door. So build your cultural principles and habits and what you expect right up front and don't let anybody in the door that doesn't fit. I, so performance management, how many like the annual performance management process? <laughs> Nobody raised their hand, I'm not surprised. So I like to look at that more as what is your, what is your feedback process look like? It can be in the moment, it's far better than regular, but if you have the annual performance management, you better reinforce the cultural values you have in that. Communicate, which seems kind of obvious, but what's interesting about this one to me is uh, if you're the senior person that's trying to build your culture, don't communicate first. The first thing you do is start modeling the behavior that you are after. And then when your directs start noticing, hey, uh, you know, you used to start our meetings this way, now we're doing this and you're expecting that. Yes, that's the new, that's the new way. So the next, once they start noticing, that leader is gonna pass it down to their directs and not go any further until we've got that nailed. So communicate it very clearly, uh, the need to change. And it's interesting whether you have 
a burning platform to change or whether you're just trying to take your team from good to great, both work, but you need to be very clear um, what you're doing well and what you want to change. Are, are any of you having these kinds of conversations with your teams right now? Or are you part of conversations with someone else having these So once you, you can see, we've got the chocolate. That, uh, trust me, that's chocolate. You're up on top, and you're, commu you're working your way down. Well, the interesting thing to me about this that was an aha moment for me is I used to think, OK, I've, I've, I've powered my directs. And now they can carry this culture forward. What this is implying is this leader stays attached all the way down to ensure that we have the consistency in the habits and the behaviors and the messages and the performance that you set out to have. It's not like you're not controlling, you're not interfering, but you're demonstrating your commitment because what you permit, you promote. And if something else is going on that you don't want, you need to make sure that you're giving that feedback right away. All right, so this is the summary. Uh, this is the plan that you need to take in a, on the one page, going through and establishing the top lever leader habits, moving through your structural changes and so on. So uh, this can be done. This is more about now doing it what works for you. What worked for somebody else may not work for you. Uh, okay, so part of what we, I didn't touch on enough is how you're, how you're measuring this from a performance perspective. So how how are, if you start this journey, how are you going to make sure you know behaviors are consistent top to bottom? And how often are you gonna measure that? And habits and performance. So I think a really concrete example that I could give you is while United had a fantastic culture journey underway, it did not drive consistent habits and behaviors through how IT delivered software. So what I chose as the core of my uh, culture was the Agile framework. Because the Agile framework, when you drive the consistent behaviors, habits, messages, you get the performance. And, and it's a really good framework to uh, say, this is how work gets done in my organization. So how did I know it was going well? Velocity, quality work in process. And when those things started to go south, you knew there was something upstream. It wasn't a technology problem for sure. It was something going on in your organization. Okay. We just talked about that. So I hope now that gave you some insight on uh, why to take the culture journey, what it looks like, who's involved, how to measure the success. Any questions for me before I switch gears? I, I just a comment. I think it, we need to consistently be aware of what's going on deeper in your organization. You know, occasionally I'll discover something is completely against the culture and it may have been going on for a while and then how do you, that's a challenge. Yeah. How do you get in, recognize it as the first step and then addressing it Yeah, that, I wish I had done that better. I usually waited until I heard squealing. <laughs> uh, which maybe when you have teams spread out all over the world, th there isn't a better way, but I could have done better to proactively root out. You, you just take Agile, for example. You know you start with a whole room full of non-believers that don't like it that they have to collaborate and they hate it that they're going to Scrum meeting every day, stuff like that. Uh, I, I think I, I focused, like I was saying earlier, I focused on my direct and, and them focusing on their and, and getting it moved out, moved out that way. But I think there would have been a way for me 
not to interfere with their work, but to understand how they work. We've got five minutes left, Jeff. Do you want to talk about what you're doing up in Indy? Yes. So, as I mentioned before, I am now chasing my passion and purpose to serve others in their leadership journey. So, this is a concrete, this is concrete evidence of that. So, meant to take groups like this that are serious about their career and let's get an inner circle put together of eight to 12 and let's march through a year of building your leadership skills in a, this is not training. This is a combination of multiple dimensions to this approach. It would be coaching, facilitating, training, peer support, and between each of these, you, you can see these are, I think they're powerful leadership concepts. And you would leave each one of these sessions with, just as Letitia asked, what's one thing you're gonna do in the next month to apply this principle we just learned today and talked about, and we're gonna, when you come back next month, we're gonna talk about how you did, and we're gonna coach you through getting better. So that would be the morning. Um, and in the afternoon, we would do a, bring a real problem to the table, and I would facilitate group problem solving. So you get an old seasoned CIO facilitator person to help you through this. Um, and then in between each of the sessions, you get a 30 to 60 minute one-on-one -on -one coaching session. So I'm, I'm work, actively working to get this up and running in Indianapolis in the fall. Um, and if there was interest here, I'd be happy to do it here, or you'd be welcome to join there. But I'm really excited about this. Um, as I started this phase of my journey, I got really attracted to this group that I'm working with because it's very practical and IT people like stuff that's practical. We don't like stuff that's fuzzy. And this is super practical. We could measure the outcomes and uh, not only can you see that you're making progress, but so can your sponsor that is sponsoring you to spend the day a month and, and fund it. So uh, happy to have you. Any questions about this? If you're interested, come see me. I'll stick around after where we can connect at another time. All right. Thank you. Thanks. I think it's pretty obvious that I'm a big fan of peer groups. I think it's extremely important to find people who are like-minded and to do work together, uh, whether it's formal or informal. I'm very appreciative that you're here. Um, I especially like the highly focused peer groups that have a mission like Jeff is talking about. Um, it's not often easy. Indiana has never been able to support a tight CIO group or emergent technology leader that's deliberate and meets once a month. Well, I don't have the time or my company will never pay for it or I'm not sure I want to pay for it. Um, who's going to QA your own career? I think it's gonna be you. I think it's most important to do that. So I'm excited about what Jeff's doing and I hope that IT leaders is a pipeline for success for all the leaders who get involved. Letitia, thank you so much for giving us a practical look at what diversity and inclusion looks like. Jeff, thank you for framing what culture might look like. High performance and culture are competing goals, aren't they? <laughs> it seems like they are, um, they're not. They, they don't have to be, that's for sure. If you enjoyed this, please spread the word with your network. We're gonna be back August 8th. Chris is gonna be our headliner. Mark will be speaking as well. Uh, that is at Yum Brands on Colonel Sanders Lane. Uh, if you have an interest in speaking or you know of a good speaker, I would love to hear about that. Please reach out and hook up with me on LinkedIn so that we can keep track of each other and make sure that you sign up for the mailing list so you can keep up to date. Thank you for making time for us today. Have a great day.